The History of the Eiffel Tower By Ivy Logaming It was for the 1889 Exposition Universelle, the date that marked the 100th anniversary of the French Revolution, that a great competition was launched in 1886. The first digging work started on the January 26, 1887. On the March 31, 1889, the tower had been finished in record time two years, two months, and five days and was established as a veritable technical feat. Key Figures Design 18,038 metallic parts 5,300 workshop designs 50 engineers and designers Construction 150 workers in the Levalois Pere factory Between 150 and 300 workers on the construction site 2,500,000 rivets 7,300 tons of iron 60 tons of paint 5 elevators Duration 2 years, 2 months, and 5 days of construction The construction schedule Works kick off January 26, 1887 Start of the pillars mounting July 1, 1887 First floor achievement April 1, 1888 Second floor achievement August 14, 1888 Top and assembly achievement March 31, 1889 The design of the Eiffel Tower The plan to build a tower 300 meters high was conceived as part of preparations for the World's Fair of 1889 Bolting the joint of two crossbowmen Bolting the joint of two crossbowmen C. Collection Tour Eiffel The wager was to study the possibility of erecting an iron tower on the Champ de Mars with a square base, 125 meters across and 300 meters tall. Selected from among 107 projects, it was that of Gustave Eiffel, an entrepreneur, Maurice Coeclin, and Emile Nugier, both engineers, and Stephen Sofstret, an architect, that was accepted. Emile Nugier and Maurice Coeclin, the two chief engineers in Eiffel's company, had the idea for a very tall tower in June 1884. It was to be designed like a large pylon with four columns of latticework girders, separated at the base and coming together at the top, and joined to each other by more metal girders at regular intervals. The tower project was a bold extension of this principle up to a height of 300 meters, equivalent to the symbolic figure of 1,000 feet. On September 18, 1884 Eiffel registered a patent for a new configuration allowing the construction of metal supports and pylons capable of exceeding a height of 300 meters. In order to make the project more acceptable to public opinion, Nugier and Coeclin commissioned the architect Stephen Sofstra to work on the project's appearance. The Coeclin's Plan a quite different first edition. Sofstra proposed stonework pedestals to dress the legs, monumental arches to link the columns and the first level, large glass-walled halls on each level, a bulb-shaped design for the top and various other ornamental features to decorate the whole of the structure. In the end the project was simplified, but certain elements such as the large arches at the base were retained, which in part give it its very characteristic appearance. The curvature of the uprights is mathematically determined to offer the most efficient wind resistance possible. As Eiffel himself explains, all the cutting force of the wind passes into the interior of the leading edge uprights. Lines drawn tangential to each upright with the point of each tangent at the same height, will always intersect at a second point, which is exactly the point through which passes the flow resultant from the action of the wind on that part of the tower support situated above the two points in question. Before coming together at the high pinnacle, the uprights appear to burst out of the ground, and in a way to be shaped by the action of the wind. The Construction The assembly of the supports began on July 1, 
1887 and was completed 22 months later. All the elements were prepared in Eiffel S factory located at Levallois Perret on the outskirts of Paris. Each of the 18,000 pieces used to construct the tower were specifically designed and calculated, traced out to an accuracy of a tenth of a millimeter and then put together forming new pieces around 5 meters each. A team of constructors, who had worked on the great metal viaduct projects, were responsible for the 150 to 300 workers on site assembling this gigantic erector set. The Rivet Workers All the metal pieces of the tower are held together by rivets, a well-refined method of construction at the time the tower was constructed. First the pieces were assembled in the factory using bolts, later to be replaced one by one with thermally assembled rivets, which contracted during cooling thus ensuring a very tight fit. A team of four men was needed for each rivet assembled, one to heat it up, another to hold it in place, a third to shape the head and a fourth to beat it with a sledgehammer. Only a third of the 2,500,000 rivets used in the construction of the tower were inserted directly on site. The Rivet Workers Copyright, Collection Tour Eiffel the uprights rest on concrete foundations installed a few meters below ground level on top of a layer of compacted gravel. Each corner edge rests on its own supporting block, applying to it a pressure of 3 to 4 kilograms per square centimeter, and each block is joined to the others by walls. On the same side of the construction, the builders used watertight metal caissons and injected compressed air, so that they were able to work below the level of the water. The tower was assembled using wooden scaffolding and small steam cranes mounted onto the tower itself. The assembly of the first level was achieved by the use of 12 temporary wooden scaffolds, 30 meters high, and four larger scaffolds of 40 meters each. Sand boxes and hydraulic jacks, replaced after use by permanent wedges, allowed the metal girders to be positioned to an accuracy of 1 millimeter. On December 7th, 1887, the joining of the major girders up to the first level was completed. The pieces were hauled up by steam cranes, which themselves climbed up the tower as they went along using the runners to be used for the tower's lifts. Record Construction Time It only took five months to build the foundations and 21 to finish assembling the metal pieces of the tower. Considering the rudimentary means available at that period, this could be considered record speed. The assembly of the tower was a marvel of precision, as all chroniclers of the period agree. The construction work began in January 1887 and was finished on March 31, 1889. On the narrow platform at the top, Eiffel received his decoration from the Legion of Honor. The number five months to build the foundations. Journalist Emile Goudot describes the spectacle visiting the construction site at the beginning of 1889. A thick cloud of tar and coal smoke seized the throat, and we were deafened by the din of metal screaming beneath the hammer. Over there they were still working on the bolts, workmen with their iron bludgeons, perched on a ledge just a few centimeters wide, took turns at striking the bolts these in fact were the rivets. One could have taken them for blacksmiths contentedly beating out a rhythm on an anvil in some village forge, except that these smiths were not striking up and down vertically, but horizontally, and as with each blow came a shower of sparks, these black figures, appearing larger than life against the background of the open sky, looked as if they were reaping lightning bolts in the clouds. Mr. Eiffel S. Blueprints the following blueprints are copies of Gustave Eiffel's originals, taken from the book La Tour de 300 Meters, Ed Le Mercier, Paris 1900. Debate and controversy surrounding the Eiffel Tower. 
even before the end of its construction, the tower was already at the heart of much debate. Enveloped in criticism from the biggest names in the world of art and literature, the tower managed to stand its ground and achieve the success it deserved. L'Exposition Universelle de 1889 The Exposition Universelle of 1889 Various pamphlets and articles were published throughout the year of 1886, L.E. 14 Février 1887, La Protestation des Artistes. The protest against the Tower of Monsieur Eiffel, published in the newspaper L.E. Temps, is addressed to the World's Fair's Director of Works, Monsieur Alfand. It is signed by several big names from the world of literature and the arts, Charles Gounod, Guy de Maupassant, Alexander Dumas Jr., François Capi, Le Conte de Lisle, Sully Prudhomme, William Bouguereau, Ernest Maisonnier, Victorine Sardou, Charles Garney, and others to whom posterity has been less kind. Portrait de Charles Garney Charles Garney Other satirists pushed the violent diatribe even further, hurling insults like, this truly tragic street lamp Leon Blois, this belfry skeleton Paul Verlaine, this mast of iron gymnasium apparatus, incomplete, confused and deformed François Capi, this high and skinny pyramid of iron ladders, this giant ungainly skeleton upon a base that looks built to carry a colossal monument of cyclops, but which just peters out into a ridiculous thin shape like a factory chimney Maupassant, a half-built factory pipe, a carcass waiting to be fleshed out with freestone or brick, a funnel-shaped grill, a whole riddled suppository Joris Carl Hoismans. Portrait d'Alexandre Dumas Alexandre Dumas Once the tower was finished the criticism burnt itself out in the presence of the completed masterpiece, and in the light of the enormous popular success with which it was greeted. It received 2 million visitors during the World's Fair of 1889. Extrait de la protestation contre la tour de M. Eiffel, 1887. Nous venons, écrivains, pentras, sculptures, architects, amateurs passionnés de la butte just qui si intacti de Paris, protester de tout's nos forces, de tout notre indignation, au nom du gout français macanou, au nom de l'art et de l'histoire français menaces. Contra l'erection, and plein cur de notre capitale, de l'inutile et monstrueuse tour Eiffel, que la malignite public, souvent imprint de bon sens et d'esprit de justice, a déjà baptisé du nom de tour de Babel. La ville de Paris VATL don s associer plus long temps auxiliary baroques, auxiliary mercantiles imaginations d'un constructeur de machines. Pour s en later irreparablement et s e deschenerer. I l suffit de ailers, pour s e rendre compte de c e k nous avancans, de s e figurer un instant un tour vertiginousment ridicule, dominant Paris, in z chu un noir et gigantesque chemine de usine, écrescent de s a masse barbare. Two nos monuments humilies, touts nos architectures rapidus says. Qui disparitrant dans ce rêve stupefiant. Et, pendant vingt ans, nous verons s salonger sur la ville entière, frémissant encore du génie de tant de siècles, nous verons s salonger comme un tach d'incre l'ombre odieuse de l'odieuse colonne de tol boulonne. La réponse de Gustave Eiffel. Eiffel répond à la protestation des artistes dans un interview accordé au temps le 14 février 1887 qui résume bien sa doctrine artistique, J. E. Croix, pour ma part, que la tour aura sa butte propre. Parce que nous sommes des ingénieurs, Croix en don que la butte en e nous préoccupe pas dans nos constructions et tu en même temps que nous faisons solide et durable. Nous en e nous africans pas de faire elegant estce que les veritables conditions de la force en e sunt pas toujours conformes auxiliary conditions secrets de l'harmonie. Or de quelle condition aijeu, avant tout, 
à tenir compte dans la tour de la résistance au vent. Eh bien, je pretends que les corps de Cotter arrêtent du monument, tel que le calcul les affornis. Donnerant une grande impression de force et de but, car elles traduirent auxiliary ou la hardiesse de la conception dans son ensemble, de même que les nombreux vides menages dans les elements memes de la construction accuserant fortement le constant souci de ne polyvre inutilement auxiliary violences de aragons de surfaces dangerouses pour la stabilité de l'édifice. Ilya, du reste, dans le colossal un attraction, un charme propre, aux quels les théories d'ordinaires ne sont que applicables. The end. <laughs>